Feast TV is brought to you with support by Missouri Wines, Whole Foods Market at Town & Country in the Galleria, and Lake Cole Culinaire. We have a delicious episode in store for you. We're going to be taking you to a brand new fried chicken shack. We're also going to be exploring a 100-year-old salumeria. We're gonna get a taste of championship barbecue and we're going to get a sip of some barrel aged beers. I'm Kat Neville and this is Feast TV. As I mentioned in the intro, this is a particularly delicious episode, including the recipe that I'm going to be making, which is gnocchi with a volpi pancetta. And if you're not familiar with gnocchi, it's those little wonderful potato dumplings. And we're gonna be making a mushroom and pancetta pan sauce to go with that. And we'll be pairing it with a dry red from Windy Wine Company. And if you haven't noticed, we are in some new digs in this episode. I'm here in a professional kitchen and I'm really excited to get started. So before I start making the gnocchi portion of our recipe, let's head over to Volpe and take a look at this over 100 year old family business. We've been in the food business for over 100 years. Uh, it started by my great uncle and carried on by my dad and I joined the company some 25, 30 years ago, I guess, by now. And I was joined by my children just a few years ago. We produce all of our products. Uh, we produce some very old world products like the culatello um, and the prosciutto. And we produce some newer type of products like the brizola, which is the dry cured beef that is not very well known in the United States, but is very popular because it's a very lean piece of meat. Hi. Hi. I'm Kat. I'm Johnny. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you for taking me on a tour today. I've grown up with this place, so it's kind of in my blood. Um, I've been running around the drying rooms for I, I, I don't remember when. So that's kind of where you know my love started. You kind of fall in love with this type of product. You don't really realize that it's happening. And so, what is this? This is a coppa. It's basically city shoulder that's uh, cured for uh, for over 90 days. So it uh, comes from the pork shoulder and it's stuffed. And at the end of the, it looks like this. And so, the mold that's growing on the surface. Can you tell me about that? The mold is very beneficial for our processes because the mold keeps the product from uh, crossing. And it also, by penetrating through the casing inside the meat, it's eating organic acids, it's, it's giving it a much, much more of the flavor. And a lot of other, like, salami makers around the, especially in America, they will apply mold to the surface, but not here. Yes, that's correct. In this plant, in this facility, we've been over for, we've been making salami for over 110 years. So we, in our aging rooms, we developed our own mold, so we, we think that we don't need to do this because we have our unique mold that comes from our aging rooms because of 110 years making the product. So it's Volpi mold. So it's pretty much Volpi mold. That's wonderful. Unique. That's wonderful. Thank God for my daughter because, because she got into, uh, into the business and with the passion and she really wants to make it make it for. Now I hope that my grandchildren are doing the same thing. So we're looking forward to maybe another 100 years, I guess. I think to Volpi, an artisan producer is who we are. Um, we've always had been hands-on, you know, being a family business, you wear many different hats. And artisan to me means that you are 
actually making the product, following it through the process, um, standing behind it even after it's sold. Because we don't we don't make huge amounts of volume, uh, we are by definition an artisan producer. I'm just glad that people are recognizing the quality of artisan producers now. This is Culatello. It's uh, basically, it's the best part of the prosciutto. It's the heart of the prosciutto that's uh, stuffed into the casings and it's tied by hand. And I think we are only one producer in the United States that's making culatello. Culatello is being aged for almost a year. Wow. And this is how it looks like when it's done. If you remember upstairs, you saw it. This is what it looks like. And it's how done. much of its mass does it lose? It loses for over 36, 38 to 38% of wow. its own weight. It's called Genoa Salami. It's uh, stuffed in the natural casings. And what's uh, amazing about this product is uh, that uh, we have uh, used the same recipe for 110 years. We never changed the recipe. Wow. It has been always the same. Anything that we do, we should be making it our own in some form or fashion. And so when we talk about these products and they're very traditional, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have to stay that way, but we have to keep the respect and keep that tradition there. I want to, I think that Volpe should be synonymous with quality. Making a quality product is probably our most important function here. So holding on to tradition is the second. Although we are American, so we like innovation and we like to try different things, um, and we just like to hear it back from our customers that we're on the right track. The aroma inside of those fermenting and air drying rooms is absolutely incredible. And the fact that Volpe has been on the hill for 110 plus years is testament to the quality of the work that they do. Now I am peeling just a couple of russet potatoes and I'm just gonna boil these guys in some salted water. It's been about 15-20 minutes or so and you know that your potatoes are done when your knife can be easily inserted and the potato falls right off. So we're good to go on the potatoes. I'm just gonna turn the heat off and drain these really quickly. I'm gonna be using a food mill to mash my potatoes. And this is a really great tool to very gently process anything that you want to be very, very finely kind of mashed up essentially. It's very simple. Just put your ingredient in and just it pushes everything through these tiny holes. Now into my bowl, I'm just gonna crack one egg and also mix in a cup of flour to begin with and then I'm gonna add more as needed. We are making a dough and so we're going to knead this but just like when you're making those mashed potatoes, you do not want to overwork this. So the trick is to keep it very, very light and just barely combine all of these ingredients. So my dough is not sticky. It's holding together nicely. So just like in making a regular dough, I'm just gonna spread out just a tiny bit of flour so that my dough does not stick. And all I wanna do is gently roll this out into a log shape. You know, I, years ago, made gnocchi with none other than Wolfgang Puck. He was in town, it was when uh, he had a restaurant at the St. Louis Art Museum, and I had a chance to make gnocchi with him, so I learned from the best, let me tell you that. I'm gonna break this up into smaller pieces so it's easier for me to work with. Okay. And then, you just use your pastry cutter, and cut these guys into little pillows. go. I'm going to go ahead and finish up making all of my little potato dumplings. And while I do this, let's head over to Q39 in Kansas City. The gentleman behind the Munch and Hogs 
barbecue team has opened up a new restaurant and it is absolutely one of the most popular places in town. So let's go get a taste of his barbecue right now. Yeah, I transferred from Denver and came here to Kansas City. What a cool state. So what I want to do, find something to do for a pastime outside of work. Well, I found out they came up with this thing called barbecue and all over Kansas City. And they do these competitions and everybody goes against each other and you go out and just have a great time. Sometimes drink too much, but that's okay. We're number one team in the nation twice, reserve grand champion once. We're in the top 10 seven years in a row. At the end of that trail, I had to ask myself, is it time to open up a restaurant? And what better to open up than a barbecue restaurant after we've proven ourselves throughout the United States? My specialty in barbecuing, I've always been known to cook great brisket. Brisket and ribs are my two favorite meat items. Final process of cooking our wings for the best chicken wings on the planet. We get them nice and hot. We go ahead and put that cilantro, chipotle cilantro sauce, which has a little bit of spice. We toss that up so it's really good. And then we go ahead and put it on our wood fire grill. Gives it a nice char flavor. So we're gonna put it right here. Barbecue means a lot of things to a lot of different people. When I was growing up, we used to say, hey, let's barbecue tonight and throw hamburgers and hot dogs on the grill. So we're not gonna battle what the customer thinks barbecue is. So here at Q39, we did both. We made sure that we did low and slow or offset smoking. So that is all the authentic ways of barbecuing that we did on the barbecue circuit. But at the same token, we took a wood fire grill and introduced using some smoked items with direct cooking. One of the great items we serve here that's on our wood fire grill is our barbecue salmon. Our barbecue salmon is a nice seven, eight ounce filet and we season that perfectly with our Q39 seasoning salt. We put it over that oak grill, we cook it until it's medium, we brush it with just a touch of classic sauce, and we put that over our jalapeno cilantro slaw. It's a great crunch, and the freshness that goes with the seafood is just unbelievable. Everything in the kitchen is made from scratch. If we can make it, we're gonna go ahead and do it. I think in Kansas City, we have the best barbecue connoisseur in the nation. People in Kansas City who live here, we live and die by great barbecue. That's what we're known for. Did I think I was gonna be this busy in a year and four or five months? Absolutely not. But I'm glad to see that customers understand the most important thing in a restaurant is quality of food and service, and they're willing to pay for good food. The first step in our really kind of light and luscious pan sauce is to render the fat from the pancetta. And pancetta does have quite a bit of fat in it. If you don't have pancetta, of course you can use bacon. Um, you could even use sausage in this kind of an application. But pancetta obviously is the very traditional Italian way to cook this dish. So I'm just going to get this into the pan. You don't want your heat to be too high because you don't want to burn the pancetta. You just want to render out the fat the same way that you would with bacon. So while this is rendering, I'm gonna go ahead and start prepping the vegetables that I'm going to be cooking with. And so I just need to do a small dice on my onion. And I'm gonna chop up my mushrooms. All right, we are there on the pancetta. The fat has been rendered out and it's beautifully golden and crispy. So I'm just taking this out of the oil. I'm just gonna set it aside while I finish prepping my mushrooms. These are creminis, which are just a baby version of portobello mushrooms, which a lot of folks don't realize, but they're actually the exact same mushroom. So I'm just gonna dice all of these up along with some shiitakes. Turning the heat back on in my pan, all that wonderful and delicious fat is still inside of the pan along with some bits and pieces from the pancetta. I'm gonna put these mushrooms in. 
I'm gonna let those caramelize and then the onions are gonna go in. So you probably know from cooking mushrooms at home that all of that wonderful fat and flavor is gonna be absorbed into the mushroom and then as it cooks, a lot of that moisture is just gonna kind of render back out. So I'm gonna let this sit for a moment and properly caramelize. And while that's resting in the pan, I'm gonna go ahead and chop up a couple of tablespoons of fresh garlic and also strip the thyme leaves off of my fresh thyme. Can't have enough garlic. And here we have fresh thyme. And the easy way to take these leaves off so that you're not picking them off individually, which would just drive anybody bananas, is you just take the stem, hold it on the end, and then just pull, like that. Then all the leaves just come right off very, very easily. We're there, these mushrooms are beautifully golden. So I'm gonna add in now my one diced onion, just a yellow onion. Okay, the onions are nice and cooked. I'm gonna go ahead and add in that garlic. It's gonna smell pretty fantastic in here, along with my thyme. I'm gonna give that a quick stir, and then I'm gonna add in some chicken stock. So when you add liquid to a pan that has been cooking things like, like pancetta or sausage or meat, what builds up is called fond, F-O-N-D. And when you deglaze it with, for example, chicken stock or wine or even water, what you're doing is you're releasing all of those flavor elements that have kind of built up on the bottom of the pan. I'm gonna let this kind of cook down just a little bit and then I'm gonna finish everything off. But before I do that, fried chicken is on everybody's minds and plates these days. And there is a fantastic new spot in St. Louis called Southern. You're gonna crave this chicken after you see this piece. So let's head there right now. So rumor has it that the hot chicken like started out of like a lover's quarrel kind of. This lady got very angry with her husband and decided she was going to get back at him. So she fried up her Sunday chicken and then dipped it in all kinds of hot chilies to I like, get back at him. So what we do is a little different than what most people do. Like there's no buttermilk or eggs in our fried chicken. So we do a very acidic marinade on our chicken and then we rub it with a spice mixture. So this like imparts a lot of flavor very quickly into the chicken and it also adds like that base layer of spiciness. And this is our dredge. It's a real nice kind of light dredge. We put a, a couple different starches in here and the same thing with our uh, same seasonings as our rub and uh, our marinade. We just keep building like the whole flavors on the whole thing. The different styles of chicken that we offer, we do the original, which is just the fried chicken, medium, which is still falls under the category of hot chicken, so it's very spicy hot and then clucking hot, which is our hottest level, which just kind of blows your doors off. So what we do is we just kind of give it a quick dunk in the hot That's chili oil. Yep. Yeah. This is our medium. Each level gets progressively like more red and more ominous looking. <laughs> so staying true to the uh, Nashville chicken joints, same kind of thing. Everything gets served on white bread. So oh, Rick, you make so many people happy. The most uh, commonly asked question in the restaurant, what is Hoppin' John? And it's like, uh, kind of like red beans and rice, but with stewed black eyed peas. We put some of our house made andouille sausage in there and, uh, and then some rice. So the Southern Greens, we render out a bunch of our delicious salt cured bacon, add in some onions, garlic, the greens, uh, chicken stock, and we just let those cook low and slow till they're completely tender. And that's our Nashville medium hot chicken. Good stuff. The hot chicken is definitely the focus, but I don't want to take any of the focus away from the sandwiches because we put a good bit of work into these simple sandwiches, you know. As far as the sandwiches are concerned, we make everything from scratch. So we make the pickles, the mustards, like all the sauces, all the deli meats, the salamis, 
hands would cure everything. So like, even though they're simple, like just a real like quick grab and go snack, we put like a lot of hours into building these sandwiches. Uh, kind of one of the most popular ones is the fried bologna. Once again, just another kind of comfort food, St. Louis staple kind of thing. We make a real rustic country style bologna, uh, which has like dices of pork through it, a little bit coarser grind, and then we smoke it on the smoker, which is, it's just fantastic. And then we top that with some pimento cheese. This is like diner style. Yeah, That's which fun. is something I'm very excited about. Let's go, let's go, it's starting to look, see how we're getting nice and melty. I mean, come and on, Rick, seriously? It's killer, isn't it? <laughs> and it says piled high on the menu, so we wanted to go with that whole there's piled high thing. Over the top. I'm gonna finish it off with some of our chips here. That's good stuff. Okay. It's over. You win. It's killer, isn't it? Yes, definitely. That's a sandwich. Yeah. That's something that it's kind of like a knife. Once and you probably want to come back like every week. And People you have been have it. loving it. That's why I say yeah. we're changing changing lives one bite of bologna at a time here. <laughs> That bologna sandwich is the thing that dreams are made of. Uh, it's really fun to see what Rick is doing there at Southern. Just good old comfort food. So what I'm doing here is I am just cutting up some pieces of butter. I am going to add this to the pan. I have turned the heat off of our pan sauce and I have the water boiling for the gnocchi. So before I drop the gnocchi in, I'm gonna go ahead and mound in the butter, that's what it's called. And what it does is it just makes the sauce really, really silky and helps to bind it together. Let that sit and do its thing. And here's our gnocchi. I'm just gonna drop these in very, very gently. Now, as with any dumpling, what you wanna do, number one, is be very gentle and very kind because they're delicate. You don't want to squish them. Once they kind of float to the surface of the water, that's when they're finished. While my gnocchi is cooking, I'm just gonna chop up a little bit of parsley, and add that to the pan. The gnocchi have popped to the surface. I'm just gonna pull these out put them directly into the pan. All right, so I've got a bunch of gnocchi to finish up. You don't need to watch me do this over and over again. So let's go have a drink. Uh, we're gonna head over to Second Shift Brewing. They are really doing some innovative stuff, particularly with sour beers and also barrel-aged beers. So let's go take a sip of that right now. I never pilot batched, I never tried sampling or making test batches. I just know when I gotta make a new beer today and then I see what I have and I do it and 15 minutes later I'm brewing. If you're smart, you would test batch stuff and tinker around, but I, th I always uh, liken it to if you're a chef and you know what you're making food, you start knowing what the ingredients do and what they're gonna taste like. That's the best way I explain it. You see what it tastes like before you make it. Uh, every time it's come out in the ballpark, if not on the infield of what I thought it would be. Our friends down at Pickney Bin, they started barrel aging gin. And the gin is a very herbal. The only thing I see where that would work well with would have been my hibiscus wit, which is a Belgian wit beer, which is kind of spicy and, and, and fresh and tart and clean to start with. This is gorgeous. Is this the hibiscus that you were talking about? That's the hibiscus that sits in that wood. That's been in there for about six weeks now. So the color's gotten darker. Now, used to, normally it's kind of a pink, I know it looks pink now, but it's the color is definitely changing from the wood, I think. But I haven't sampled this yet. It smells sweet. Oh wow. It's definitely different from the normal hibiscus, yeah. That's really complex. The gin's really doing it. It really is. I mean, so you get all that wonderful kind of like herbal floral mm -hmm. character from the yeah. gin, but then obviously hibiscus has that tart. Is it what you were expecting? There's more than I was expecting. <laughs> <laughs> I really like it. Me and Steve uh, kind of hit it off uh, one time at a beer festival. He'd been doing some interesting stuff out here that I really wanted uh, to learn from and uh, see what he's doing. 
uh, see his methods and his madness. And uh, I, I, we, in January, I left uh, the former place and uh, came out here. The base beer that I'm working on is Katie. It's a uh, barrel-aged uh, Britannomyces Lambicus beer. We put it in neutral oak barrels, which were formerly wine barrels. And uh, but today I'm, uh, I'm putting it on peaches in a tank and let it age on peaches, give it a little bit more residual sugars for that Britannomyces to to do some numbers on and uh, see what it tastes like. People always ask me, "What's your what's your favorite beer?" I was like, "The one I haven't brewed yet." The sky's the limit with uh, with what we're doing here, so it's pretty neat. Let's go try LSD, which is my uh, 11, liquid spiritual delight, which is my 11 and a half percent beer. Nice. This is the first time I've ever uh, come on a shoot and been asked if I wanted to try some LSD. That's probably all we need of that. I'll warm that up. That is, that's 36 degrees, which is way too cold. Okay. It tastes a lot better when it's warm or at least room temperature, 55, 60 maybe. Oh wow. It's a big, thick, chewy beer. That is delicious. It's coffee notes, but it also, I can, it's got burned to it too from the booze. It's, yeah. it's boozy from the barrels. It's good. The first coffee beer I ever did was with LSD, Liquid Spiritual Delight. Went to the guys in Blueprint, talked to them. We tasted and blended and did all this kind of jazz. It was the best beer I've ever, it was phenomenal. Still say it was my best beer ever made. It was just that coffee, and that beer played so well together. It's just amazing what a good coffee can do to a good beer. It, yeah. it could, the two, the sums are greater than the two parts, yeah. So Civil Life brewed their first beer in here before they were up and running. And then Four Hands did the same thing. They were just, they were still in the middle of building their brewery. And I told them, you know, why don't we brew a beer together, get their name out there a little bit earlier and they could work on their beer they were designing. There's no other industry that you can do this. The community is phenomenal. Everybody helps everybody. I mean, it's just a great, and like I said, you're making beer. What could be better? <laughs> I just love seeing how creative people have gotten in the craft beer industry. And first off, you should try Pink Knee Ben's Barrel Age Gin. It is really, really interesting. Um, and very unique. And I don't know if there are really very many other barrel-aged gins out there, so the fact that it's being made here in Missouri is pretty exciting. Um, now, this is our gnocchi. It smells wonderful, and as you can see, it is incredibly simple. Perfect for early fall. And so I am pairing it with a red blend. Now, this is a blend of Chamberson and also Norton grapes. This particular wine, it's young, and it has a little bit of effervescence, which really kind of adds to the experience when you first try it, and it develops beautifully in the glass. So as you take bite after bite of the gnocchi, this wine is going to change. It's really delicious. Well, thank you for joining me for this particularly delicious episode, and I will see you next time.